Amen. Good morning again, family. You guys ready to hear the word of God preach? You guys hungry to hear the word of God preach? Amen. Well, God is raising up some powerful leaders in the Metro Heights region. We're going to have two incredible, fired up campus ministers preach the word to us this morning. But before they come up here and just lay you out with the word of God, I just need to give you a little, 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 little introduction on what they're going to be talking about. So today's theme is freedom. And our dear father in the faith, John Causey, helped us to come up with this theme. And, and we, we kind of tweaked it just a little bit. But the theme is freedom. Rise from the lies. Now rise stands for something. The R in rise stands for reflect. The I stands for investigate. The S stands for sample. And the E stands for experience. And so these brothers are going to come and preach the word to us on how to be set free from the lies of the world. Amen? And so I want you guys to give your hearts fully. I want to hear some amen. I want to hear some hallelujah. Hallelujah. And anything in the word of God stirs your soul this morning. You better say something, amen. amen. And at that, I give you our dear brother, Gerardo. And it's very interesting. If we go to Acts chapter 4, Come on, bro, preach. 
Go ahead, Al. Al, chapter 4. Give me that when you guys get there. Come on, bro. Go ahead, Al. Amen. I'm coming. I'm coming. Amen. Acts chapter 14, amen. Amen. Come on, bro. So Acts chapter 14, I'm sorry about that one. Acts chapter 14, and we're going to pick it up in verse uh, 1. So keep in mind that this is uh, Paul and Barnabas are coming from Antioch, and they're arriving in the city called Iconium. Uh, and it says in verse 1, At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went to their usual synagogue uh, place. There they spoke so effective that a great number of Jewish and Greek believed. Now, isn't it fired up when you guys have anything that is effective? Yeah. Yeah. I know when you wake up in the morning and you guys are not very effective on snoozing that alarm and waking up for the first time, yeah. it throws up your whole schedule. Right. I know there's, uh, there's some brothers in the house they pick the snooze button way too many times in there. <laughs> and let's keep reading. Uh, verse 2 says, But the Jews who, refu uh, who refused to believe stirred up the other Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So Paul and Barnabas spent a considerable time there speaking boldly to the Lord, who confirmed their message of grace, enabled them to perform signs and wonders. So their message is so effective that they get such a group of people that come to them. But then they have other, the other side that people are like, you know what? I know you guys should listen to them. Right. Oh, I think they're poisoning your minds. Oh, and every time Paul and Barnabas would go anywhere, they would create a division. And it's interesting, if you guys keep on reading, uh, I want to skip on this, but they created such an impact that people were plotting to stone them. And then Paul's like, you know what? It's time to move on, amen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Paul and Barnabas said, like, you know what? Let's go to the next town. And they go to uh, Lystra in Derby. And this is where I think this is gets very interesting because we get a personal account of the first person I want us to reflect on. And let's pick it up in verse 8. Give an amen when you guys get there. Amen. You ain't want to hear the word of God today. Oh. Verse 7 it says, In Lystra there a man who was lame, he had been awake from birth. He had never walked. He listened to Paul was speaking. Paul looked directly at him and said that he had faith to be healed. And Paul called out, Stand up on your feet. And that man jumped up and began to walk. So you see the account of the first uh, parent, you can say the lame person in the account, and this guy from birth was not able to walk. Just try to put yourself in his position. The things that you think that are normal to us, getting out, brushing your teeth, you know, walking to your car, everything this man had to do was twice as hard as you. This required a lot of humility in his side. When you have someone that you have to depend on, that is not usually what we want to do. We want to be independent. But this man learned that he needed to be dependent on the people. And it's funny because Paul said that he looked directly at him. Just like I'm looking at Quentin right now. <laughs> directly at Quentin. That means like his attention or the, the attention of the disciples were purely on this guy. So if you guys are studying the Bible, you're going to get some attention right there, amen. amen. And you're going to have to learn to be in the spotlight. And to learn to love the spotlight. Yeah. And I know for me, I don't love the spotlight. Oh. I'd rather be sitting in the back, you know, just doing my thing, <laughs> enjoying the sermon, doing my thing. Really? But you have to learn to be in the spotlight. Come on. Right, and this comes with disciples coming to your life. Mm -hmm. So if you have people that are coming to your life and trying to get into the Word of God with you, you're going to be in the spotlight right there, man. Amen. 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 So, I think it's very interesting. Paul calls out to this man, stand up in your feet. And now, this guy had two choices to make. You can either sit down and laugh at the disciples of what they're calling you to do, or you can get up on your feet. Wow. What decision are you guys making this morning? <laughs> but you see, if you were just to just listen to the word and the calling of God, to just stand up on your feet, it would not be as hard as it may seem it is. It's a lot of you guys have been paralyzed your whole life, and then all of a sudden you have someone coming to your life, and they're like, "It's time to get up in your feet." Right. 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 I'm like, I don't know if I can do this. It seems too hard. The calling is it's too challenging. Yeah. But it's supposed to be challenging. Mm -hmm. That's right. And I think about a brother in our ministry. I think he's in King's Kingdom right now. Our brother Alex, right there. Yeah. And we were on campus, and I don't know how this came to be, but we were sharing with the guy, and we're talking about. We started speaking about working out. And we were like, man, how many pushes can you do? I'm like, I don't know. 
I like even like maybe 30. And then my brother was like, bro, I can do 38. And I was like, do it right now. <laughs> so he started getting on the ground, started doing push-ups. He does like 28 and then, but that was pretty good considering like he's like, a, I was just a short little brother. But then, then uh, after that, we started bringing it, started bringing up a bench press. And now it's just like, I can bench 45s. Wow. We were like, prove it. <laughs> so right, right after campus, we literally drive to a, a Planet Fitness. Oh, and then, keep this in mind, we're dressed in our campus outfit, I'm doing my thing on campus, and then we drive to the, to the gym, and we're like the oddest looking group. I'm wearing like regular casual wear, the brothers are doing their thing, and then we walk into the gym and we kind of surround this bench press, and we started having like a show, we started being loud, and then we took over, the, this guy was actually bench pressing, like, bro, can we press just one set, and then we'll give it back to you. He's like, yeah, let's do it. But you have to spot me afterwards. I'm like, all right, man. So we put the 40 pounds on each side, and Alex starts to, you know, starts to get ready. And you can see, like, they're down with that brother. I'll be like, bro. I just think it was like, bro, you can't do it. Just be safe, bro. I was like, no, you can't do it. So you get started with the bench press, he's about to do 45. And the moment he picked up the bar, you're like, bro, there's no way you're gonna do it. His hands started shaking, and then he's just like, oh. so his brother goes down to 45 and goes down like, oh, help me! <laughs> and I was just like, I got you, bro, I got you. And I started lifting the bar, and they were just cracking up with the time. It was funny, but he had so much speed he can do it, and now all I had to do was help him. And when someone comes into your life, you may seem like, oh, this is too heavy, I can't do this. But God is like, dude, I'm here to help you, to, to help you, to inspire you. <laughs> So let's go, let's continue the story because I, I just like to, to preach from the Bible right there. I like to go through a little passage to break it up. That's, I just I just like the word, I love the word of God. You see, the word of God is like a pomegranate. You say, what do you mean a pomegranate? Well, a pomegranate on the outside is dry, it's hard. There is not much to it. But once you break it out, it's like juicy. You feel it. And you're just like, oh man, it's delicious. I get fired up with the word of God, man. I get excited with the word of God. So, let's keep reading with the story. I'll break it up, sis. I'll break it up. Uh, let's pick it up in verse 11. When the crowd sound of Paul, had, um, well, I'm sorry, when the crowds heard what Paul had done, they shouted in Laconian language, the gods have come down to human form. Barnabas called out Zeus. Paul they called Hermes because that was the chief speaker. The priests of Zeus were the temple just outside the city and brought bulls and all these sorts of animals to crucify. And in verse 14 it says, but when Apostle Barnabas, Paul heard this, they tore their clothing, rushed out into the crowd shouting, friends, why are you doing this? We too are only humans like you. We're bringing you good news, telling you to turn from your worthless living to God, who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them, and in the past, he let the nations go their own way. So you have to keep in mind that Paul is speaking to a crowd that does not believe in God. They believe in their gods, you know, and Zeus. And, they, and when they see this man being healed from not being able to walk his whole life, you're like, we gotta sacrifice to them. These guys are Zeus and Hermes. They have common human form. And Paul makes the point, look, I'm just a human like you. Please don't do such a thing. And he's tore his clothing. And then I like the fact that the Bible says, um, I'm sorry, what is it? Uh, it says to turn away from your worthless living. And I feel like a lot of us come from living a worthless life. Yeah. And if you think about something that's living, it has to be something that is important at the moment. And I know for myself, I used to live a very worthless life. All I did, and just put it frankly, I went to work, I went to school, and that's all I did for my life. And it was a worthless way of life because I was addicted to my video games. And every time I said to someone, hey, I was addicted to video games, like, we were addicted to video games? That is an addiction. But a lot of us have different kinds of addictions, and they're worthless in your way of life. And then it says that God has allowed you to live this way, but then God says that not longer will you live this way, now you will live a kind of different way. And God is telling you, you guys are preaching here today, that God wants you to live a different way of life than the way you have been living. And I don't have a trick, I get fired up about that right there. Let's finish off the 
story here in verse 19. This is actually my, my favorite part right here. And then verse 19, it says, Then some Jews came from Antioch to Acunium and won the crowd over. They stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city, thinking he was dead. But after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up and went back into the city. Next day, Barnabas and him left the derby. So now you get Paul, and he's gone through it for the gospel. I mean, I don't know, have you guys ever been stoned? No. I mean, I have been stoned, but you can, you can think about them, they were going through it. And I think about, I have a lot of stories from Mexico, so <laughs> I was a little kid, man. And I remember um, down the street, there was like an open field, and nobody was living there. It was like in between two houses, and the grass was like, like 10 feet tall. So me and my cousins thought it was a good idea to play with some matches and some gasoline. We're like, you know what, let's turn, let's turn on this little piece of, of uh, field right here, this little piece of grass. So we turn it on, and it starts to go crazy. Ah, oh, let's turn it on, let's turn it on. And we did this several times. And then we turned it off, and we thought the fire was out. Mm -hmm. So we walked to our house, and all of a sudden, 15 minutes later, we start hearing ambulances, firefighters. Like, What's going on? So we walk outside the house, and then the fire was like 10 feet tall. Like, it was crazy. Yeah, firefighters everywhere. And then the neighbors saw us, did it. And I was just like, I looked at my cousin, and I was like, I had to reflect right there what we just did. And I was like, brother, the house is on fire. Like, the, the house started to burn because of the fire. And, and then I remember speaking to my mom, and she was like, what do you guys do? And I'm like, we, we were just playing, and I knew the chancla was coming in. <laughs> I knew the chancla was coming. I couldn't, I couldn't do anything to stop it, but I had to reflect on what I've done. And we did get the chancla, it was, it was pretty fire, man. And then I remember afterwards, we met up with my, with my cousin, we had like a little hot love group. We were like, hey, how you guys doing? I'm doing good, bro. And then Paul had did the same thing, because he just gone through the, he just been stoned. And then uh, um, scholars believe that he was actually dead. And it was the spirit who had brought him back to life. But then it's funny that he gathered with his disciples, and afterwards he's like, hey man, let's go and keep preaching the word of God. Come on, man. Come on, man. So your faith is reflective. And just to close it off, let's go to Acts chapter 3. Come on, bro. Acts chapter 3. And we're going to read a similar account of another paralyzed guy. who We get a little bit more detail to what happened. Uh, it says, one day, in verse 1, chapter 3, one day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer, at 3 in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg to those in the temple courts. When, when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, and as did his John. Then Peter said, look at us. So that man gave his attention and expected to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I have I will give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him get up, and instantly the man's feet and his ankles became strong. He jumped up to his feet and began to walk. So you see this incredible problem that always blows my mind. Because I like to picture myself in the situation of this guy. Your whole life, you've been subjected to begging. I don't know if I can beg. I've never begged for money. But he's been subjected to begging. All of a sudden, his life is going to take a right hard turn to God. And you got the picture. His soul body, he's been subjected to this. And his bones and his muscles, his ligament, nothing was where it was supposed to be. But just with one word, his whole body, his muscles, his joints, his blood, everything came together. And it started to become strong. And, and then he was so fired up, he shouted out, he started screaming, this is all for the glory of God. And this will happen when you come to know who God is. That you will no longer be conformed to the way of life, but you will be transformed to God. And without being said, uh, faith is attractive, faith is reflected, and faith is God-given. To God be the glory. Give another round of applause to our brother and brother. Come on, Danny! Come on, man. Well, I personally wanted to thank you know John and Emma for believing in me and just leading me and encouraging me and inspiring me and giving me this opportunity to preach, and especially to Aaron and Sheila. Thank you so much, guys, for your discipling. I'm so encouraged to be in the battle with you guys and to learn from you guys. I know uh, Gerardo just preached on the attractiveness of faith. Today I'm going to continue that lesson, amen. Come on. Come on.
we're going to talk about the journey to righteousness. Turn your Bible to Psalm 119. In Psalm 119. It's a long one. So keep flipping because we're going to verse 105. You know, some of us are from the inner city. Some of us are from the suburbs. Some of us may be from the neighborhood. And heck, some of you might be from the streets. That's where I'm from, Chicago. But no matter where you're from, we all are conditioned in the way of wickedness. We're all trained what not to be. We're all trained in what the world wants us to live like. And for us as Christians, we really got to live the other way. Oh, yeah. We've got to embark on the journey, the path to righteousness. Now, in this passage right here, we're going to reflect on how to go on that path. Let's read in Psalm 119 and verse 105. The Bible says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. I have taken an oath and confirmed it that I will follow your righteous laws. And the church said, Amen. you know, what's powerful is for us as Christians, whether we're on campus at our colleges or we're at our jobs, the Lord has really embarked us on the journey, the path to righteousness. And for us, you know, we live in a world where there's, kind of, there's a generational sin of comfort. The generational sin of quick and easy pleasures where we want things to be painless. And what's powerful is the journey to righteousness leads us down the painful routes. So I wanted to talk to you today about how to stay on the right path to righteousness. Amen. But before we even get into that, we got to talk about the four spiritual drifters. Number one, the sin of discouragement. You know, many of us have a lot of enemies. We all got a lot of enemies. But the truth is, the last enemy we need is ourselves. And when we embark or allow ourselves to fall into the sin of discouragement, it just takes us away from the path of righteousness. Number two, the sin of entitlement. You know, many of us can be, quote unquote, a Christian and at the same time not be content. And if we're not content, the problem is you're doing Christianity the wrong way. As Christians, we ought to be content in everything we're given. And the sin of entitlement is to command and believe that you deserve all that you've been given. And as men and as women, for us, we've got to be men and women who are not greedy and always want and are content with what we have. Amen. Number three, the sin of greed. Wow. Greed is an intense and selfish desire that's unquenched. Yeah. Uh -huh. just so many times we want more than what we need, and that's because we're not focusing on getting our needs back. <laughs> Deep down, for us as Christians, we've got to be men and women who are really holding to the path to righteousness. Right. Number four, the sin of pride. Wow. You see, the problem with pride is that it's hidden inside. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not you can't see it, but other people can. Yeah. Yeah. And because other people can, we're all affected by that pride. But for us, we've got to have brothers and sisters that can help us and to lead us to deal with what's hidden inside. I know for me personally, growing up, I was very much so all four of these things. I grew up in an environment where people were just unspiritual. We cursed all the time. We lied all the time. Pride was cool. It was cool to be arrogant. It was cool to be special and think you're better than other people. It was cool to put other people down. And that's a similar way. That's who I was in the world. That's who I was before I studied the Bible. And I had to learn really what it meant to really cherish and build relationships that last. Not relationships that are fragile and momentary, but real friends that are really going to be there for you. 
And I know for me, I'm so grateful for the brothers and sisters that studied the Bible with me and allowed me to see what it really meant to embark on the path Amen. to righteousness. Now we're going to embark on this journey. Turn your Bibles to the book of Ezekiel. Come on, bro. In Ezekiel chapter 14. The Bible reads here in verse 14. Notice the three names. Even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, they could save only themselves by their righteousness, declares the sovereign Lord. Now right here, we understand that God had a top three. And in his top three, he decided to have a top three of righteousness. Now, everybody has a top three that they love. Isn't that true? We got a top three movies. We got a top three musicians. We got a top three songs. We all have a top three of something. But our God had a top three of righteousness. And for us, we got to really appreciate the righteous people that God has given us. And out of all the people of all time, these three men who were God considered the most righteous people. Now, we can preach all day, but to, to, for time, we're going to just go about Noah, amen? Let's turn on, to the beginning in Genesis chapter 6. We're going to go to Genesis chapter 6. In Genesis chapter 6, in verse 9, the Bible says, this is the account of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time. And when he walked, he walked faithfully with God. And the Baptist ministry said, Amen. You know, in the NLT, the Bible says, Noah was a righteous man, the only blameless person living on the earth at that time. And he walked in close fellowship with God. Now, Noah, imagine being this man. He was the only blameless person on the face of the earth. And for many of us, that's us being on campus. You're surrounded by unrighteous people, people who are worldly, people who don't have in mind the things of Christ. And so many times we can feel alone in those challenging situations where we're being called to obey God in the midst of a wicked, dirty, nasty, unrighteous generation. Many of us are conditioned to be a certain way in the world, but Noah was the direct opposite of that way in the world. And for us, we've got to imitate Noah's four righteous pillars. Number one. He was God-focused, not people-focused. Yeah, yeah. Number two, he was a God-pleaser, not a people-pleaser. Number three, he was a saver of the lost at any cost. And number four, he was a preacher and not a follower. Noah was so focused on God that the people didn't even. And for us, we got to be men and women that aren't like everybody else. It may be uncomfortable to be righteous. It may go against the grain yeah. to be righteous. Yeah. The truth is, it will. Yeah. And for us as men and women, we've got to take on the responsibility given us by God. And we're going to please Him and not ourselves. We're going to please Him and not other people. You know, no one is given the charge, as you all know. To build an ark. And in this charge, Noah's built charged to build an ark that would really fit two of every species on the face of the earth. I mean, imagine giving that responsibility. You ever wondered how he built such a thing? Or even an even more challenging thing, in my opinion, would be how in the world are you gonna get every species inside of this ark? I mean, just saying that sounds overwhelming. 
And you thought finals week was hard. This is hard. Yeah. Now, for Noah right here, he, he decides to do something that we all need to imitate in our righteousness with God. Turn to chapter 7. In, in Genesis chapter 7, the Bible reads in verse 5, Then Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him. Noah was 600 years old when the flood waters came on the earth. And Noah and his sons and his wives and his sons' wives entered the ark to escape the waters of the flood. Yep. Hairs of clean and unclean animals, of birds, of all creatures that move along the ground, male and female, came to Noah and entered the ark. As God commanded Noah. And the church said, Amen. Now, when you notice what Noah does, Noah builds the ark. He sets his heart on obedience to God. And when Noah set his heart to obey God, we can notice what God does in return. God decides that he's going to be the one to bring all of the animals, all the creatures, onto the ark so Noah didn't have to get that job done. Now, what this teaches us is, number one, for us as disciples, we've got to be men and women who understand what it takes to build our lives. Yeah, and for Noah, as he obeys God to make sure that the ark is built, we got to see the parallel to what it means to us in this generation. For us in this generation, we've got to see that Noah built the very thing that could potentially save all humanity. Wow. And in a similar way, we've got to build the very thing that's going to save our lives and potentially the lives of others. You know what that thing is? Come on, Daddy. you got to build a relationship with God. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, bro. My problem. Noah understood there's nothing more important than the relationship you have with God. Yeah. And that was the very thing that kept him righteous throughout this time. Mm -hmm. And in a similar way for us, we've got to be men and women that are focused on building that very thing yeah. so we can embark on the righteous journey. Amen? Yeah. Come on, Come on, Daddy. You know, there's a friend of mine. His name's Brandon. Mm -hmm. And Brandon is from Mexico. Brandon was born there in Mexico about 19 years ago. Right. And when Brandon was born there, his family was very poor. So his family decided that we're gonna move to America. Now, in this situation, Brandon didn't have the opportunity to really get it done the right way, so Brandon had to cross the river. And while Brandon was eight years old, on the journey, he decided that he was gonna cross through, through this narrow road with his family, but his family went on ahead of him. And as Brandon was at the back, this one man pulls a gun on him. And while Brandon sees the gun, he sees the moment that his family's out of reach and they have no idea what's going to happen. And if he screamed, he's probably going to get shot. Wow. So Brandon grabs the gun. The guy shoots Brandon. Brandon, out of self-defense, kind of chokes him out and sprints away. Brandon eventually gets away and moves to Shoreline, Washington. While being in Shoreline, Washington, of course he healed, he grows up, and he grew up in such a way where he wasn't very educated. When he got to America, he was diagnosed with dys 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 dyslexia. Sorry, it's all yeah. Yeah. And so severe that when he, he sees any words on paper, it just blurs. It goes back and forth. It's blurry. He can't read words properly. But in the same way, he's still focused on getting his education. So Brandon decides that he's going to go to college as the first one in his family. Brandon goes and gets into college at a school called Shoreline Community College. And while Brandon is in college, by the grace of God, we have a church in Seattle, Washington. So while we're in Seattle, myself and others, we go to start a club over at Shoreline Community College where we're able to build Christian Bible studies. And while we're there, I run into Brandon. 
Brandon and I build a friendship. He comes to the costume party, and he's, he's a big dude. See, what Brandon decides to do is he wasn't going to just have school as his main avenue. He was also going to pursue other means of a career. So Brandon, at 400 pounds, was able to lift 800 pounds. Brandon also has one of the biggest smiles when you see him one day, and he decided, I'm going to be an actor. So he pursued his acting career. Mm -hmm. And although Brandon was so strong, he still wasn't strong enough to save his own life when he has a heart attack. Mm -hmm. He's sitting in his car, and it's a normal day, and he nearly dies. Brandon, while he has this heart attack, he's the and he decides to send me a text. And little did he know, when he sent me that text, he says, bro, I want Jesus. You won't believe it, but we got to talk. Wow. I'm finishing up a leaders meeting where it was just announced that I'm going to be moving to here, Los Angeles. And I love LA. Thank you so much for welcoming me. <laughs> I, I get that text in a leaders meeting, and, and I share it with the church and say, hey, man, guys, do you guys remember Brandon? It's like everybody remembers. Imagine Eric, but bigger. He's bigger than Big E. We get called Big B. Amen. So he he decides to send me that text, and we get together, and we meet up with them, and it was challenging studying the Bible because he can't read. So he would listen to the audio Bible for his quiet times with God. He would learn, and when you're doing a Bible study with him, he just sits there and just focuses in on every single word in the scriptures that's read. And what's amazing is despite all the challenges in his life, Brandon today is going to get baptized wow. in Seattle and Washington. Okay. You know, no matter how strong you are, how talented you are, how gifted you are, Faithful, you may think you are. We all need Jesus. We all need the truth. And just like Noah and just like Brandon, we all need to be righteous. This isn't a suggestion from God. This is a command from Jesus. Let's turn our Bible stipulations to close. In Galatians chapter 3. The Bible reads in verse 11. The Bible says, clearly, no one is justified before God by the law because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, the man who does these things will live by faith. Them. Here is a promise given to us by God. The key to life, many of us want to have a great life. We want to do what's right. The key is to live by faith. Mm -hmm. When we live by faith and when we explore the Bible, when we study it out for ourselves and examine the areas that we need to change, oh baby, the yeah. truth gives you the opportunity to be saved. Yeah. I want to challenge you today. If you're here with us visiting, get into the Bible studies with the person that brought you out. There's nothing, and I kid you not, nothing more important than life. Ask anybody that's ever been on their deathbed. They will tell you that their relationships are important, but I tell you, and they die, they're going to tell you when they see Jesus, that your relationship with Jesus is the most important. Yeah. Build that relationship today and pursue righteousness. I love you guys. Bye -bye.